And we'll play through the beginning of the game, and then we'll jump to the middle of the game, play through and do that, and then we'll show you some uh, never-before-seen features that are not actually in the game, uh, but are, are useful to talk when about just to figure out how we got to the game. When she died, she left behind over 300 canvases, not one of them finished, along with memoirs who felt pretty unfinished himself. The orphanage allowed him to keep only one painting, and so he chose the unfinished swan that had always been his mother's favorite. But that night, he woke up to find the swan had disappeared. So he took his mother's silver paintbrush, and followed the footprints into a little door he hadn't seen before. So the game begins with a completely white screen, and pawn players usually spend about five seconds or so waiting for the game to tell them what to do. And then they get bored and they start pressing some buttons. And they can hear the player start to move around and, and jump. And then they get even more bored and start pressing all the buttons. And uh, then they eventually hit the triggers and fire these black papers. Like I said, it takes usually about five seconds, although we have seen it take up to two minutes for a player to uh, get that bored and, uh, and begin pressing buttons. Because at this point, you know, gamers are used to the game laying out you know, like exactly what the game is about and, and what uh, they have to do as players. And this game goes in the opposite direction. So it's a game about exploration, and we wanted players to feel like they were exploring not only the world, like physically exploring it, but then also exploring the game itself and figuring out, as they play the game, what sort of a game and what sort of a world this is going to be. So we start off with uh, a very abstract space. In the beginning, it's all you know, solid lines and, uh, and kind of boxy room. And eventually, we layer in a bit more of a natural environment. So the players realize that they're not you know, on the moon here. They're in like the forest, basically. And everything initially is very static, and now we sort of see the world is actually a little bit more alive than uh, players might have initially expected. This is the first creature the players see is a frog that uh, ends up being eaten by the second creature that the players see. And for inspiration for the game, we looked to a lot of stories. So we wanted to create this you know, experience that evoked a sense of awe and wonder, and found that uh, the things that did that the best for us were. House of Wonderland, particularly, and then also to some extent, Edward Corey, and Chill Silverstein, and, and a bit of Jim Henson. And one of the things that they all had in common was this sense of a darker world that was not entirely safe for children, uh, going back to like, even Grimm's fairy tales. And that's something that we tried to keep alive in the world. So even though it does have this you know, kind of light fairy book tone, or fairy, fairy tale tone, there are a lot of things in the world that are not necessarily pleasant. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways for the players to uh, to die in some of the ways, but it's all uh, relatively painless for players. So we wanted players to keep exploring the world. And so we did things like not limiting the number of paintballs players had, so that even though the world may occasionally push back, players were always in the mindset exploring and feeling like it was okay to try things out, that the game was going to reward uh, exploration and, and curiosity rather than punishment. Uh, so this is the first time that players are going to encounter the king and the statue that the king has created himself. Not a very shy man. Uh, he has a magic paintbrush and can create basically whatever he wants, which ends up being a bit of a curse because he creates a lot of unfinished things, constantly moving on to the next thing. And as players are moving through the world, they're exploring a bit of the king's life. So they're seeing you know, the things that the king created as a young man, like this you know, elaborate sort of, uh, statue garden that they're in now, and you know, there's a labyrinth coming up later. And as they move through the game, they're going to see the king as a more middle aged and eventually as an old man, the kinds of work as an artist that, that he's created. And uh, this is the first moment that players have to look back over where they've come in the game and see all the stuff that they've splatted. And it turned out to be a surprisingly emotional moment for players that uh, really speaks to the kind of player that they are. Uh, we found that everyone plays the game a little bit differently. So like hardcore players may start off and we get a couple seconds of figuring out that they can do something. Their first instinct to try and do is try as much of it as possible. So they just start spamming balls everywhere, where other players are much more selective. Carefully, like artfully, basically try to throw as few balls as possible uh, to make the world you know, a little less uh, messy when they're done with it. 
And so when players have a chance to look back over where they've come, uh, it's a surprisingly personal thing where they can see the areas where you know, like they may have gotten stuck, for example, and it'll be all black in an area. This uh, red balloon is the first balloon that the player finds in the game, which are collectibles that are scattered around the world. One of the things we tried to do in the very beginning of the game was to do away with as many conventions as we could in typical games to make something that is very unlike uh, a normal game, and we failed in a number of extents, uh, like you know, having collectibles in the game, but ultimately we found that it was something that provided a lot of really useful uh, advantages for players, you know, like gives a way to add a bit more life to the world, the so that you know, instead of having color white want. space, we were able to you even create you know, a couple of brand lines, new colors. Uh, and then also but just, Felt right you know, gave players a reason for exploring places that he's might have uh, gone down. And he soon found so himself with bigger These storybooks that are scattered around the world give players a little bit more backstory. Um, the king and uh, you know, the world that the king has created. And initially we expected that they'd be a hardcore thing, like the audio logs of the game that will tell you about the failed experiments that's, you know, the A37, the experiment, or whatever. And it turned out to be something that almost every player that we see gravitates towards because the game is so minimalistic that every little detail that we put became hugely important for players. Uh, so that's the first area of the game, and then we're going to jump uh, forward to the middle of the game, which, as you can see in a second, is quite different. So in the beginning, everything is, is all white, and you're moving forward uh, you know, very slowly, splattering the world as you go. A lot of players liken it to being blind, and it's something that, in the beginning, uh, we really like how tense it is and how you know, novel the experience is, but it starts to um, get a little bit old after about 10 minutes of, of novelty, where it stops becoming you know, about a sense of exploration and discovery and becomes more of a challenge. So rather than try to take one mechanic and build a game around that, we tried to essentially create like the first 15 minutes of an interesting game over and over again. So we're constantly throwing things at players that they haven't seen before. So hopefully they never get too comfortable. Uh, so we're throwing new mechanics, and then also as you can see the art style of the game you know evolves over time. Uh, partly you know in the way that the king character evolves over time. So you know instead of creating uh, you know the, the labyrinths that he was making earlier in Statue Gardens, now he's creating this vast world. Uh, sort of an empire, a, a city-state that uh, the player has a chance to look up instead of moving, you know, sort of five feet at a time, the player can run through the world and see where they're going. And now we introduce the vine-growing mechanic that we have in the game, where the player can splat these uh, water balls in front of the vines, and the vines will grow up pretty much any surface that the player and it's a corollary to the way that initially they're splatting the world with these black paint flats, and now they're sort of drawing in uh, these green lines of, of the vines across the world. And uh, one of our goals of the game was to make players feel a little bit like a child, and one of the best ways we found that was to be able to give players the ability to make a mess. So by the time they're done, you know, they can look back and, uh, and see a horde of vines that you know has covered the areas where they've been. This is the second appearance of the sea monster, and we find uh, a lot of players completely miss it. Uh, like they miss a lot of things in the game. We made a conscious decision about halfway through development that. There were a lot of things in the game that a lot of players would never see. And it's a little sad when you work really hard on something and you know that you know, players are very goal-oriented, which be going in that direction and will completely miss the stuff off the side. But you know, maybe they can see it on a second playthrough, maybe they can see it on YouTube. Uh, but we wanted the world to not grab control of the player every five minutes and force their camera to look at things, but instead to have players really you know, be exploring the space and in control as much as possible. And uh, you can hear the swan in the background, so in the game the player is chasing after the swan that is always a few steps ahead. And we found that in the beginning, when we were developing the game, and we had uh, you know, just this white world that the player was trying to you know, make sense of, that after about 10 minutes or so, players started to give up. That they felt like without a sense of a long-term goal, uh, it became sort of meaningless noise to them. And 
it was frustrating because as designers, we wanted to create something that really felt open and didn't tell people about what the world was. But uh, with like, adding in the spawn was, it turned out just enough uh, for players kind of counterintuitively to uh, be able to veer off the path. When we told them where we wanted them to be going, which is the swan, then players felt peaceful enough that they could go off you know, a completely different direction and explore the world. So we ended up making the world feel a little bit more open by making the game a little bit more linear. The vines, in addition to you know, creating climbable surfaces for the player, can also be used to uh, activate these topiaries that are scattered around. And the next thing we're going to show is uh, some like one mechanic that did not make it into the game, and one mechanic that did, uh, just showing sort of the development of the game and why we made some of the choices that, uh, that we did. This is our river painting uh, mechanic that, as you can see, is fairly early on uh, in, in, or in development. And the player uses their water balls to create a puddle that turns out to be like 10 feet deep. And we had a lot of fun coming up with ideas for you know, what you might be able to do with the insta puddles. Uh, like here's a sponge dinosaur that when you get wet, the giant you know, the dinosaur expands. And ultimately, you know, it felt like something that really should be a part of the game. We wanted to create an experience where players felt like you know, we were giving them these toys to, to go out and, and play with. But you know, partly because other games have taught players this, and partly because we ourselves and you know, other parts of the game taught them this, players really expected an objective. And so rather than kind of you know, freely exploring the world, they were poking at it, trying to figure out, like, what do I have to do? OK, now, like, what, what do you want me to do? And we just didn't have a good answer to it. Like, it's a fun toy to play with, but it's not something that really lent itself to uh, the kind of slightly more goal-directed uh, experience that we found worked best with the other mechanics. So you know, we, we wanted to give players a sense of freedom, but it turned out that giving them complete freedom uh, had the opposite uh, effect. And here's uh, the vine growing stuff, which we, we saw a moment ago. This is Kelly Santiago from That King Company, who is one of our earliest unhappy playtesters of the Vine mechanic. Uh, it was really fiddly, and you know, when we started off, we wanted it to be something like, you know, we looked at the paint splats as being you know, like just a, a paintbrush that you're spotting the world with, and we wanted something that felt a little bit more like a pen. Like something that you could draw with, and then players could create you know, lines or whatever they, they wanted to do. But uh, actually, in giving players more control, in this case, like, you're growing the vines instead of in the spot in front of them, you're hitting the vines and, and causing them to move in, in straight lines, that more control ended up not necessarily like, empowering players, but having the opposite effect. Uh, so we went with something that was a little bit less controlled for the next version of the vines. And, uh, at this point in the game, each of the water balls would grow one vine, which again, we felt like you know, we wanted to give players a little bit more control over, over what was going on. And the direction that we went instead was to give the vines a lot more personality of their own. So in the final game, I don't actually know how the vines work anymore because we added so many bits of randomness to the way that they behave that sometimes they'll do things that are completely unexpected. Even people that have been working with them for like a year have no idea why the vines did what they did. Uh, but it ended up being a really nice counterpoint to something. So instead of giving players like a very fine brush, we've given them essentially another paintbrush of like throwing you know, this uh, green brush against the wall and having the world kind of explode as a result. So rather than growing, you know, one vine, I think in the game now it's something like six vines that just like explode out for every paintball. And so, yeah, like ultimately we, we had this idea of making something that would empower players by giving them very precise controls. And we found that it was actually more empowering to take that control away and to just make the world a little bit more random and, and chaotic and uh, you know, a little more explosive and full of land. We started off with, you know, storybooks is inspiration, and we wanted the game to have the feel of a storybook, which is something that you know, we I think settled on like a handmade look. That we wanted something that felt like it was the work of an artist, that, that someone had kind of painted the, these worlds. And it was relatively easy to do for things like creatures, where you had a lot of round shapes and a lot of personality to it. But unfortunately, the game is really an exploration of architecture. So as players are moving around the world, they're exploring the things that the king had made. And the king's not a very personal guy. He builds a lot of like giant towering buildings. And it was difficult to get uh, these sharp-edged buildings to have the same kind of uh, hand-drawn feel that the concept art has. 
So we started off, this is the, the very first pass in the, the city area, that you can see looks a lot like the beginning of the game. Right? It's very black and white, and there's nice minimalism to that, but ended up kind of fighting the tone that we wanted. Like we wanted something that moved away from the earlier part of the game to something that was kind of softer and, and a little bit more full of life. So uh, you know, we had something that was more of a two-tone look here, and then ultimately you know, we went with something inspired by uh, Pottery Barn, like our art director is a houseware store in the US, I don't know if it's overseas, but uh, he was walking through this houseware store and looked at the color coding for the boys and the girls areas of the store and was really drawn to the soft blues and the very soft reds, or pinks, I guess, for the girls. And so you see like the, uh, the all the roofs in the city have this really soft, childlike blue that uh, ended up being a good fit for the kind of storybook feel of the game and then also uh, you know just a good counterpoint to the rest of the game which has a you know more high contrast and a little bit sharper feel to it uh, and that is the presentation so i think we've got a few minutes for questions uh, do you have any intention uh for the opening levels for instance have some kind of unlockable mode where you see it as if it was fully pink so you can see everywhere you missed at one time rather than yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, we totally did for a while, and then it just felt like it was, uh, you know, seeing behind the curtain a little too yeah. much. And I was uh, showing the game off for a friend of mine at Harmonix recently, and there was like a room full of 30 game developers, and uh, the game was crashing, it was an earlier build, and I had to go into debug mode to do something, and I toggled on the mode where you can see, because obviously as developers, we, you know, have reason to need to be able to see the world, and everyone in the room gasped. They're like so disappointed and there's something just like really unsatisfying that you know the game is has this sense of mystery that is so easily broken when you go into something like debug mode uh, so yeah we, we definitely thought about doing it and then it just ended up being something that uh, we didn't like the result of yeah well there are four chapters to the game so i can certainly say that there are four like distinct areas of the game and then some of the areas uh, well, I mean, the chapters. Some of the chapters have like, one sort of primary core mechanic, and then other chapters have a couple. So that's that's about as much as I think I can say without giving giving more away at this point. Uh, yeah. So I think most concretely by killing players, uh, you know, by by putting monsters and environmental hazards that the player is you know kind of cognizant of, and it turns out that it's actually a kindness a lot of times to kill a player. So in the city area that you saw, you eventually are growing up these very tall structures. And so when you fall off the structure, uh, you drown almost immediately or like, get eaten by a shark or whatever. And it's much nicer as a player to actually like, be right back where you started from rather than like if you had survived the fall and now you've got to climb your way back up. So you know, we, we wanted players to feel like the world was not totally safe uh, as a human being in that world, but as a player, they were still encouraged to you know, be, be going around and, and trying whatever they wanted. So yeah, mostly by killing the player, I think would be the thing that we found had you know, like the, the you know, simplest and most direct uh, result there. And do you plan on giving players a level as well? Because I think it would be kind of fun to, to think how other players would think in your own level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to. I would also love to do multiplayer or all kinds of other things in the game. Unfortunately, as a 12-person company, there are a lot of things that we would love to do that we just can't do. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would love to see that. Uh, I am hoping that you know when the game goes out that people you know, will go on YouTube or whatever and make crazy drawings uh, with, with the tools we've given them. You say you leave the player to make their own decisions and go through the game. <clears throat> what if the player gets stuck and just doesn't get it? Is there a nag sort of kind of help system, or is it just like, look, play the game? Uh, what we did ultimately was just a lot of play tests. So we definitely had moments where players would get completely stuck. And in fact, the area that you saw right there, uh, the city area where players were growing the vines, was one place where we see some players that would just spend like 20 minutes and they wouldn't see the vines we wanted them to do. So the solution for that was just a lot of play testing and a lot of tuning. So in that area, like the way that we solved it was by having like the swan fly through and draw players' attention, and then the vines grow a lot farther, and just like trying to have people fall into the pit of success. That they just feel like they've accidentally discovered this thing. So you know, in the beginning, for example, the vines would uh, the very first pass on that, the vines would cover that whole black thorn ball, and we found that players were just like magnetized to that. Like they keep trying to do something with that black thorn ball that had vines on it. So we just killed that. It's really just stripping away the things that were confusing to players. 
And so we really want players to feel like they're discovering it for themselves, but actually they're discovering things that 50 other playtesters had a hard time with that have then been like carefully stripped back. So yeah, I think uh, some players will definitely get stuck, but our feeling is that it's better to have like two out of 100 players that you know have to go online and figure out how to get forward than it is to uh, you know completely change the way that the game is and, and give people really pop-up hints. Uh, one surprising thing also is that I had thought that the game would be suitable for people, uh, you know, players, I don't know, like six and up or so. And it turns out that there's this developmental stage, it seems, where like the two players that we've had that were under 10 that have played the game uh, did not get out of the first room. They just discovered like, oh, I can splat things. And they're just like, I'm going to splat everything. I'm not going to move. I'm just going to make this whole thing black. And they had a good time. But they didn't have that kind of more adult fear of like, maybe I should be doing something more important with my life than, than just making a mess here. And the game kind of requires that you have that sense of like, I want to see what's outside of this room. And for people under 10, oddly enough, they, they didn't have that, at least the people that we've tested. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a long-winded and circuitous answer to that. But hopefully, yeah. Even though it's not, of course, a first-person shooter, I was wondering if uh, there is a conscious decision not to show any sort of a throwing mechanism from at the bottom of the screen. The balls just spawn from the middle of the screen. Is mm -hmm. that a particular reason for that? Yeah, uh, because it's easier, I think, was the first reason that having a hand and all these things, like, um, you know, there's no good reason for why the balls are, are kind of like where the balls are coming from or why you have a million of them. So it's something that I think because we couldn't find a good answer, we just tried not to dwell on it. So the balls kind of magically appear. And oddly, like the more helpful it is for players, the less they question it. I don't think we've ever had anyone, you know, like put their hands in and be like, where are these balls coming from? They're, just, they're happy to have the tool. Uh, so we did look at things like, you know, having feet in places would be nice where you could look down and know that you're gonna walk off something, but ultimately it was really hard to do that right. And so we were afraid that we would end up with a solution that, like, even in AAA games, a lot of the, you know, the hands and feet and things, like, don't really look all that convincing. So it just was something we felt like we could get away with because of the minimalist tone of the game. So it was a problem that we, you know, kind of avoided uh, because we didn't have to solve it. Yeah, actually, the toys are things that you can carry with you in the main game. So, like, one of them, for example, is a toy called Stop Time that will stop the balls in midair. So you can throw them and then they just like hang there. And then you can unpause and then they all, you know, crash and do whatever. So like in the beginning of the game, you can use that to just like basically paint the whole world if you wanted to, like set up balls and then just like let them loose. And in the city area, you could grow, you know, tons of vines by just like making whatever you wanted or like making shapes. So it's totally useless. We wanted to make it something that players knew, like, had no bearing on the main game, but was just something that if they wanted to mess around, and they're basically all things that came out of debug tools that as developers, things that we tried one day and we're like, oh, this is so cool, like you should check this out. And then you know, we found a way to just like put them into the game. And they're just things that felt like it was in keeping with the rest of the game that was just, you know, something to mess around with. Sorry, I think we're uh, oh, reading that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can come up and ask questions. Yeah. If you want. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.